Many moons ago, I posted a video with the dreaded C word in the title, Crankwalk. It ended in a question mark. I could have jabbered on about every little detail I encountered related to my failure and wrapped it all up in one video. Could have done it, but I'm glad I didn't. It served as a great example for contrast in my 200 series videos. Time to look at the mains on the 7 bolt and summarize what blew up. I spun rod bearings, but they didn't do it by themselves. The mains tell an interesting story about what happened and it's possible to read them. Check the description for other resources. This block did not crank walk. I think people are too quick to diagnose crank walk with a 7 bolt short block failure, and there's really a lot more to it. If you look at main number one, it's in pretty good shape despite the fact that the oil system was circulating metal shavings. These chunks of bronze are pieces of my rod bearings. There's also some divots and softer layers of the bearings embedded in the surface. Those are the lighter colored spots. Number two is in really great shape too. There's a little bit of uneven wear on the right side, but the radius cut edges are still in the right shape. It was located properly and doesn't appear to have shifted. So if there's any scoring, it's due to the shape of the block's journal. Scoring isn't that bad on number one and number two. And I know that didn't happen until the rod bearings went. Number three immediately shows light trenching and extreme particle wear. The brown area is ground up bronze shavings. This kind of wear comes from a dirty oil supply, and it makes sense because a lot of oil is delivered here. There are four oil holes on the center main, and oil grooves only across the parting lines of the thrust bearing. You can see the face of it is pretty badly beaten up by how the wear is centralized on the saddles of the journal and where those chunks exited the bearing surface. Here we are at the number four main. It looks just like number two, except the scratches and chunks are bigger and more prevalent. This is the journal that supplies the number three rod bearing, which was in the worst shape when I tore it down. Between all the chunks and scratches, you can see the original top layer coating is still evenly worn across its face. No alignment issues, no load issues. Number five has some of the larger, heavier chunks embedded. That's easily explained. Not only did the number four rod bearing that this supplies oil to fail, but it's at the end of the main oil gallery at its lowest point. So naturally, it's going to catch all the big pieces and chunks. This one's extremely shiny, and that indicates some deflection in the crankshaft is likely. I may have bent my crankshaft on my previous clutch failure. This bearing only has one oil hole supplying the groove, so if a chunk is introduced, it doesn't really have anywhere else to go. Looking at the 7 bolt main girdle's number one bearing, it's barely worn. I'm sure the scratches and chunks here happened on the drive of shame coming home from the track. The number two bearing shows uneven wear on the left side as if it were installed slightly crooked. The bearing was centered properly when it was assembled, but this points to a journal alignment problem, or a bent crankshaft. The other half of the number three thrust bearing shows the worst damage. You can see the shiny troughs worn into the saddles along the oil groove, but there's something really curious about this wear pattern that's more obvious in this light. Look at the bronze area on the right side of the bearing. There are divots from chunks being ejected, but there's a scalloped pattern around the edge. This isn't normal bearing wear at all. This is some kind of thing that you see from extreme torsional vibration, a bent crankshaft, or both. It takes quite a bit of hammering to create these shiny troughs in this scalloped pattern. They weren't just created on the drive home from the track, they were created by an extended and excessive drivetrain shock. That shock translates into torsional vibration of the crankshaft. It's a twisting force with bound and rebound. And the reason I destroyed my six puck clutch, not the clutch's fault, mind you. This is the point where most people would say, oh, you've got 14 thousandths an inch of crankshaft in play and a Swiss cheese bearing. That must be crank walk. Nope, this isn't. So far, a new crank and a line hone and a new set of bearings would fix everything we've seen here. The back side of the thrust bearing is worn somehow. Normally, no forces are applied here, and it's in relatively good shape because it's evenly worn. Where oil escapes across the fillet radius seems to show the worst of it. But if we flip this beast around and look at the side facing the clutch, the whole outer layer of the bearing is gone, worn to the bronze. Why? There must be at least seven thousandths of an inch of wear here. I'd estimate that because it's how far the thrust clearance is out of spec. Six thousandths is nothing. That's not far enough to take out your crank angle sensor, cause the crank to contact the block making woodpecker sounds, or cause the clutch pedal to fall to the floor. Those are the major complaints with crank walk. Let's look at the crank. Pardon me, I zoomed in a little too close here. But even blurry, it's easy to see material embedded in the number three journal of the crankshaft. This is a pretty substantial divot. When this happens, the material surrounding it becomes a high spot. Oop, I see a chunk of something that tried to get away right here. This is the kind of stuff in the oil that did all the damage. 
Once this stuff is jammed into the oil clearances, this is what gets embedded in the crank, creating a high spot and wiping bearing faces, or embedding into the bearing where it can cut a groove in the crankshaft. This bearing material is softer than the crank, but the friction takes a toll over time and can cut it. The fillet radius towards the front of the motor is fine, and I expected that. There should be no thrust loads here, but if we look at the trailing thrust journal of the crank, we find it's deeply grooved and mangled. This took a lot of abuse, and clearly it didn't wear evenly. Either the chunks being expelled from the trash in my oil carved these defects into the surface, or uneven forces have been applied into the thrust faces, distorting the flatness of this journal. If you look at the other side for contrast, you can see how bad this really is. This side could easily be cleaned up. This side? Not so much. This crank is done. The number one rod journal is in great shape. The bearings appear to have absorbed all the chunks and there aren't any major grooves cut into it. It passes a fingernail test. Fillet radius is fine. No junk build up in the chamfer of the oil holes on the crank. Number two looks like it's pretty much the same. Passes the fingernail test. Nothing here that won't polish out. The number three rod journal is just mangled. Destroyed. I don't need to fingernail this to tell, but I'll do it anyway so you can hear how bad this is. Friction plus extreme pressures have melted, hammered, and fused the ground up bearing into the face of the rod journal. It's like this all the way around. There's build up in the fillets and junk built up inside the chamfers. Number four has material embedded as well, but nowhere near as bad as the number three rod journal. There's a few embedded chunks, lots of scoring, and some loose stuff stuck in the fillets. The surface of the journal definitely has parts of the polished and hardened outer layer worn away from coming in contact with the rod. Same goes for number three. Like I said, this crank is junk. I would not have this crankshaft turned, polished, and put back into service. In some cases you can get away with that, but DSM crankshafts aren't very forgiving. The outer layer is hardened because it's a forged crank, and removing material will compromise its strength. You won't be able to add that hardened layer back onto the crankshaft. The crank never contacted the block, I haven't had the block magnaflux to check for cracking, but based on the wear of the main bearings, I don't see anything that's happened to them that a line hone can't fix. All the damage seems confined to the crank and the rods. Because this is a numbers matching block for my GSX, I'm going to keep this block around for a rainy day. Maybe I'll build another 7 bolt someday soon, but for now, it's going into storage. If you're going to store an engine block, it's best to put the rotating assembly back together and torqued properly. The mains aren't in alignment unless they're torqued, and this way all the parts experience the same environmental changes together. My crank may have been bent, but I'm torquing it back in here to add extra support to all the main journals. I also like to put all the original baffle plates and bolts back in these parts so they don't get lost and I don't have to look for them later. All the funk and oil that's in the block is a good thing, so there's no point in cleaning out all the metal chunks. When it goes back into service, it would need to be hot tanked anyway, and the oils coating everything are a great rust preventative. Coat the head mating surface with WD-40. Put rags on it to prevent abrasion while in storage. If you have any rust or oxides on any surfaces, like around the water pump, clean them off first because they can lead to pitting. Coat the whole block in rags and WD-40 to ensure they can't trap moisture on any of the surfaces. Wrap the whole thing in stretch wrap or saran wrap to isolate it from humidity in the air. Oops, I got ahead of myself. I meant to put the front case on. They call it stretch wrap for a reason. I also want to put the rear main seal back on it to further insulate the crankcase from air and humidity. Notice I didn't put bolts on either of these. You don't need to. They both have dowel pins and the stretch wrap will hold them in place. So that's the inside of the short block. It's full of trash, the crank is done, but the block itself is fine. I will have it magnafluxed if I think about putting it to use again. Let's take a look inside the filter. It's the last thing we can learn from. This is a medium priced but premium Mobile One brand M1 110 oil filter. There's plenty of ways to cut an oil filter open. Don't use a cutting tool that will fill the inside of it with metal shavings. No dremels or hacksaws. There's a can opener looking tool designed for this, but I don't have one. An air chisel works too. You could do this with a buck knife, but you just can't use mine. Inside your oil filter there's a bypass valve. Some call it a drain back valve and I'm not exactly sure why. This valve is designed to open when your filter element becomes a restriction to prevent it from collapsing the filter. I say when because every filter will have this valve. If the element becomes clogged, it ensures the engine still receives oil, albeit dirty unfiltered oil, but oil nonetheless. This is a decent filter. It uses a synthetic fiber element that's firmly attached to the metal end plates. All the other parts inside of it are steel, 
but these size filters are likely to bypass more oil because their filter elements are usually smaller than the bigger fatter ones. Oil filters bypass some of the oil and that's just how it goes. I don't want to spend all day talking about filters though. I just want to clear all this overburden and get to the pay dirt. Oh yeah, look at this glove. I'm getting good color here. If I were Parker Schnabel, I'd clean this up and buy a new engine. But unfortunately it's all bronze and not gold. Not iron pyrite. Still fool's gold where I'm concerned. There's a thick coating of metal shavings across the whole filter element. I don't see much along the lines of aluminum flakes here, just a couple. Shiny silver tinted flakes are aluminum. The tin and lead from the bearings are dull and grind up easily. They're impossible to spot, but the bronze color means bearings. Most all of this is bronze. You don't want to find aluminum in your filter because the donor will either be the oil pump or the camshafts. I never found iron or steel in the oil filter because I use magnetic oil plugs, but you could look for that with a magnet if you suspect it. All of this mess is just from munched bearings. My bearing failure was triggered by the combination of high oil pressure and a clutch problem that caused excessive torsional vibration of the crankshaft. As the clutch chattered, it caused everything in my rotating assembly to shake out of its normal harmonic frequency with the firing order. Add compression, inertia, the weight of everything connected through my rotating assembly and the valve train parts, and it nearly twisted my crankshaft into a pretzel. It's really important to keep torsional vibration dampened, as my example proves. That's something I failed to do. As the rod bearings were pounded to the point of spinning, they got ground up into chunks that fell into the pan, which then got sucked up into the oil pump and recirculated through the entire oil system. This kind of bronze and oil coating will be covering the inside of every oiled component inside the engine because of the filter bypass valve. That means the turbo center section, the lifters, the oil pump and cooler, the oil squirters, all of the oil galleries, the cam angle sensors bearings, the crankcase, even inside the baffle plates of the valve cover were all subjected to this. These chunks are what tore up my oil pump gears and center main. If any of these parts will ever be put back to use, they will need to be thoroughly cleaned out first. So again, I will stress how important this bolt is. This hidden bolt, this one stupid M8 by 60 bolt that often gets left out during service work that requires the transmission to be removed. This bolt is what balances the torque loads across the rest of your transmission bolts. Without this one bolt, every time you mash your clutch, you apply the clamping force of your clutch pressure plate to your transmission bolts, because that's actually how the clutch works. All of them screw in from the passenger side except for this one bolt that fills the gap at the bottom corner of the block. If this one bolt isn't there to balance out those forces, the bolts will back out over time with repeated use of the clutch. Once I nailed that detail down, my clutch never operated so smoothly. It was the clutch I always wished I had, but the damage was done. My engine would have suffered an oil-related failure even if that bolt had always been there. It would have just taken longer to do it. So here we are squared up on the input shaft. I've got my transmission bolts here. Uh, I'm going to use these to illustrate my point a little bit better. So this is the, uh, the hidden bolt. We can call it the crank walk bolt. We can call it anything we want, even though crank walk's a misnomer here. And uh, what I'm going to do is show you 7.8 millimeters. Really, that's an M8 bolt by roughly right there, 60 millimeters, M8 by 60. And this is the bolt that goes through this hole. Now, in relation to where the input shaft is, which is right here, you can see that when you have this bolt, both of these lower bolts in line, the input shaft rides above it. If for some reason this bolt, due to poor maintenance or oversight, is not in this hole or gets loose or falls out, then the only bolt you have next in line, oops, I got that one in the wrong hole, is the starter bolt. And if you were to take the straight edge and put it across here, look where that input shaft lines up, below that point. That means that if this bolt is not in place, automatically your clutch is going to engage and disengage crooked. It's going to apply all of its force on the top side right here because the transmission by its nature, when it forces its force against the clutch, is going to rock the lower portion of it away from the block, even if all of the other bolts are tight. Over time, the starter bolt's next. The lower bell housing bolts, they're next. So in light of the problem I experienced, I'm curious to know how many cars have uh, improperly been diagnosed as being crankwalk victims simply because of a poor maintenance issue. I got my car this way. I bought it used with 104,000 miles and it never came with this bolt. I didn't know to put one in there. When you're standing underneath it, you look up and you see M10 threads on the block side. It doesn't make any sense.
Well, now does that make sense? Put a bolt in that hole. This here is a different block than the one we wrapped up earlier. Even though there's nothing wrong with my 7 bolt, I don't feel like using it. I'm not afraid of it, it's just that the parts to replace it are the same ones I'd need to do a 6 bolt swap except for the block itself. I decided to go with the 6 bolt just to be on the safer side for the power I intend to make. I punched the size holes in the block that I need to reuse my JE pistons and bought some custom I-beam rods to fit them. The 6 bolt block has a beefier crankshaft and larger main rod journals. Those tend to make for a more durable bottom end, but I went ahead and added a main bearing girdle for extra insurance. I'm keeping the whole top half 7 bolt to simplify wiring and sensors. I have some minor prep work to finish up first before the final cleaning, and I look forward to sharing this build with you if you still have faith in my ability. This video wasn't intended to teach you anything. It was intended to warn you. Sometimes we learn lessons the hard way. These are mistakes I will never repeat.